Hey guys, how are you doing? I'm Takashi from Japan. So today, I interview Australian man who's lived in Japan since 1986. I went to, all the way to Fukuoka to interview him, ask him about life in 80s Japan, raising biracial kids in Japan. Literally, we talked a lot. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so now we are in Fukuoka. Yesterday,、uh, he took me to street store. The street store, yeah. Street store that he's, he's been to like 35, 36 years.、Yeah. And it was a really great experience. I'm going to interview him about his life in Japan. Can you introduce your background? Right.、Uh, I'm from、uh, New South Wales, Australia. I came to Japan on a holiday in 1985 for a month. And I decided I wanted to come back for longer in November 1986. I came here on a working holiday, expecting to stay here for one year. And it's been 37 years. And then you're married to a Japanese woman and you have three kids? Yes, three kids,、uh, very great kids, and、um, been married for 34 years, touch wood. So, at、uh, first,、uh, when you firstly came to Japan in 1985 for the holiday,、yeah. uh, what was the reason you came to Japan? Well, I'd been studying Japanese for two years, and、uh, I thought、uh, that's why I studied it for a holiday. And I came over to try out my Japanese. and...、Um, It was fantastic.、Uh, you were studying Japanese at the time. Like, I think at the time, like 30, 40 years ago, not many people learning Japanese compared to nowadays. And like, what was the reason you, you were studying Japanese? Yeah, well, at the university, it was only a night course, and we were the outcasts, the Japanese and the Indonesian language classes. But,、um, well, at the time, Japan was Australia's biggest trading partner, import and export. It was somewhere different. Yeah, I'd been to Europe and I really enjoyed that overseas holiday. It spurred me on to try and study another language. But for my next trip, I thought I'd go to somewhere completely different to Australia, and Japan just popped out. What was 1986 Japan like? Well, it's very different to today. Of course,、uh, no internet. You only had the phones and、um, the pay phone. So everybody used to line up with the green phone or the pink phone and have lots of 10 yen coins. As a gaijin, it was very hard to get a job. Well, because I didn't want to get a job as an English teacher at the beginning, because I wanted to study Japanese.、Mm. And I saw a lot of these Japanese working holiday kids in Australia, the ones whose English were really good were the ones that were just working regular jobs、mm. as a housekeeper in an Australian house or just an average Australian restaurant. So I thought I wanted to do the same thing, work in just a regular job like a regular Japanese kid. But Izakaya and restaurants just wouldn't employ me. Everywhere I'd call, I'd say, say Gaijin, damn it. Tokyo, I didn't find any jobs. I went to Osaka, no jobs as, as well. But I came to Fukuoka, and through one person's introduction, I got a job at this、uh, Izakaya. So without that person, maybe you wouldn't be here right now? I probably would have run out of money <laughs> and had to go home. There were foreigners in Japan, but just not as many. Caucasian, English speaking foreigners, there were very few. There are more in Tokyo and Osaka and even Hiroshima, you'd see a lot. But here in Fukuoka, there were very few.、Mm. And I remember I used to walk down the street and the little kids used to look at me and they'd point and say, Ara Gaijin. Everywhere you go, Ara Gaijin. Maybe they didn't do it so much in Tokyo, but they did it here. And it's funny that the younger ones were surprised, but the older ones weren't. Because I think they're used to having the occupation forces here up until about the 70s. So they were used to foreigners, but the younger ones weren't. And、um, well, sometimes it was a bit annoying. What kind of job did you experience here? Well, I was just working as a waiter in this pub and it was just serving drinks and sometimes cooking and、uh, cleaning up and、um, cleaning the tables and cleaning the toilets. And it was just a hard job. It was really hard, but it was an adventure. And.、Uh, I look back then, I just wasn't, wasn't worried about money or prestige or anything. I just wanted to get a job where I had to speak Japanese. And it's really good because they didn't treat me any differently. Because foreigners, even still now, get treated differently,、yeah. especially if you're Caucasian and especially if you're an English speaker. But where I was working, I was just like one of the boys there. And They pushed me hard. I had to work very hard then. Surrounded by only Japanese people and only speaking Japanese. Yep. Hardly ever saw any English speakers. Every now and again, you get some Americans coming in on their R&R &R through the ships. But that's about the only time I saw another foreigner. Hardly ever.
So when you firstly came to Japan in 1980s, in, you didn't expect to be here until 2023, I guess. Directly, like, why did you end up being here? Well, it's just a, a lot of things that uh, one thing led to another. Yeah. First of all, just one year, but um, I got some really interesting work and I got an extension of my visa. I'm a working holiday visa. That's another mm. big point. That's why I stayed. And then I got married mm. and, uh, and I had children here. And it's, um, it's very hard to move when you have children. I got a, a good job at the university. And um, then later on, I bought a house and now I have a mortgage. So it's just very hard to move. But, you know, people ask me, do you want to go back to Australia? Mm. Well, I think I'm adaptable. I can live in Australia or I can live in Japan. I enjoy it just as much either place now. And it's not like back in the 80s because you can get on your phone and right. talk to any of your family, do a video call. You can read any newspaper on the internet. Back in 1986, you just got nothing. I used to have a, a shortwave radio. Do you know shortwave radio? Uh, Tumper horse or... I don't no, you don't know. <laughs> ah. <laughs> There's all things I can explain to it, but you don't, don't know what they are. Have you ever heard of an aerogram? I don't know. An aerogram is, is a type of letter you used to write and, and fold up and send it. A lot had lots of American news, not much Australian news. I was always wanting to know the scores of the cricket and the rugby league, but <laughs> it was never there. You know, it, was, uh, it was just s such a world away. My life in Japan has sort of been in stages, maybe the 80s. I was single. Good old days. <laughs> and then in the 90s, I got married and I had three children. After 2000, I just had to work and work and work. From 2010 on, when they go into university, I just had to work and work so hard. So the last 20 years have just been working, trying to get my kids through school, through university. Now they've all got jobs. Now I'm in the next stage of maybe enjoying my retirement soon. But um, I look back at it and it just goes so quickly. You know, you just re realise how time goes so quickly. And uh, now they've, they've all got good jobs. Some, uh, some of them are in Australia, some of them are in Japan. Yeah, I've got uh, two of them are in Australia now and one's in Japan. And um, yeah, they're all doing really well. Back in 1990, uh, we got married, but uh, we'd been sort of dating on and off for five years. International marriages are not things you should rush into. <laughs> But, um, yeah, but we've been married for 34 years now. You met her in Fukuoka? Well, I met her. She's from Tokyo. I met, actually met her in Australia. When you went back? Yeah, uh, actually before I came to Japan. And oh, so please. I was in Fukuoka and she was in Tokyo and I was on and off. And anyway, that's another long story. But in 1990, we got married. Why do you think you shouldn't rush when it's international marriage? <laughs> yeah, well, of course, you got the culture. You got the language, you got the parents, mm -hmm. right? Your in laws. There are all these things you got to think of, right? Um, you got to think of the long term as well. It's all very well when you're young and sort of handsome and pretty and everything and, and healthy and everything, but you know, are you going to, you know, keep going? And international marriages are notoriously hard to maintain. Going home to Australia with a family costs so much the airfare. Yeah, it's an extra expense. It is really hard. You know, marriage is hard. It's hard. Get ready for it. It's hard. I guess not every, of course, but many international couples get divorced or break up. More likely, I think. I'm not sure. But why do you think, in, in that sense, you guys are successful? Well, I think one of the main reasons was that when my two boys started playing rugby, when they were in primary school, and I love my rugby and I still play. Australia. <laughs> yeah, but my wife got interested in my boys playing rugby. And so we both had this one sort of hobby. She enjoyed watching the boys play and she enjoyed the community spirit with the other mothers and the other parents. And that went right through from primary school, junior high school, high school and university. You know, as you get older, you know, adults sort of grow apart but we just had that one thing that it was just one of the things that kept us together and we really enjoyed it and it provided us both with great joy and and it helps you get you over all those rocky periods when you when your children are young and and when you've got money stress and you know in-law stress we always 
had that joy of watching our kids play. And they were reasonably successful. They don't play now, but um, I really look back and think, yeah. Thank God for Japanese rugby. Yeah. With her, you usually speak Japanese or English? I, I guess she speaks English as well. Her English is pretty good, but、um, when you're a married couple, you take the path of least resistance. So, whatever's easier, whatever's the easiest language to do, and it's usually Japanese. So, you basically raised half Japanese kids. How did you raise biracial kids in、uh, Japan? Right, well, biracial kids, you got biracial. Of course, they're going to be biracial. And then you have bilingual.、Mm. But when you say bilingual, there are all different levels of bilingualism. I had to realize that. Because they were going to grow up in Japan, native language was going to be Japanese. And、um, I knew they were going to look different at school, so you know, they were going to get it treated a bit differently. And、uh, I sort of wanted to prepare them for that, but I just made sure that they knew that、um, you know, if ever they got bullied too much or anything, that I was going to be there to look after them and they had a safe place. But when they play rugby, Yeah, they come big and strong. You know, they don't get bullied, don't get pushed around too much. Yeah. And、um, I tried to take them back to Australia as much as I could, right? Because talking about learning the language, right? You don't learn from your parents. You don't learn from your teachers. You learn from your mates. When you're in junior high school, 24 hours in a day, and you sleep for about eight of those hours, so 16 hours in a day. Of those 16 hours, how long did you talk to your father? Right, that's true. Less than an hour. Yeah. An hour? An hour would be a lot. <laughs> Less than an hour.、Yeah. Less than an hour? Yeah. That's one sixteenth.、Mm. Right? The amount of time that you get to spend with your kids, is, it's just so minor. So there's great expectations of you know, people being able to, these biracial kids being able to speak you know, two languages. But it is really hard. You've got to. Provide those、uh, environments for them, and mine was taking them back to Australia as much as I could, make sure that there was a lot of、uh, books and you know, colour books, reading books like Dr. Seuss. And、uh, the best thing I did was I sent my wife and my three kids back to Australia for one year. When they're, to,、uh, they're in primary school,、oh. and I stayed here in Japan working. And, Why? Why? For them, first of all, to learn the language from Their friends and to learn the culture because you can say bicultural or biracial. Biracial is one thing, bicultural, you've got to understand the other culture. And、uh, when you're a kid, you can get used to what other kids do. It was, it was hard for me over here eating o b e n t o every night, <laughs> but uh, uh, it really helped my kids along and、uh, it's helped them in school and university and with their work now. It was a bit of a sacrifice to do back then, but I'm really glad I did it. What's your life like here now? Well, my life is、um, just I still do work. I still got my work that I do. What do you do? Well, I was、like、a university teacher. I also do translation and interpreting. I also still play rugby. So I've got my rugby community. Yeah, I'm enjoying my life now because、uh, financial stress has is, <laughs> is left me. Uh, How has Japan changed from 1986 to 2023? Well, the whole world has changed.、Yeah. Um, for example, now I walk down the street and nobody points at me. <laughs>、right? um, that's got a lot to do with、um, ALTs going into schools. Every kid has a, had an、uh, experience of a, a foreign native English speaking teacher. I couldn't get a job. Back in 1987, but now just about every convenience store has, <laughs> has foreign students working in them now. The number of biracial kids that you see all around the place, you know,、right. one in、uh, 20 marriages are international marriages,、really? and、um, at least one in 50 children, and maybe more, that are born are biracial children. So for every classroom,、uh, the、uh, statistics say there will, there will be one、oh. biracial kid in the、wow. class. So that Is a big change.、Um, Japan used to be really cheap, then it became really expensive, <laughs> then it became sort of a bit cheap,、okay. and Australia used to be really cheap. Now Australia is really expensive, and Japan looks cheap. You know, just the cost of things just changed, you know, with the exchange rate and just the cost of living and、uh, the economy. But、um, one thing that hasn't really changed is、uh, very low salaries in Japan. 
uh, minimum wage. You know, the minimum wage has just sort of got up to a thousand yen, but still very low. Another thing that hasn't changed is Japanese don't vote. The voter turnout is always really low, you know, yeah. barely 60%. I think that's one of the biggest problems in Japan, especially young people in the 20 to 24 age group. You just look now where all the government is giving all the subsidies to all the old people right, and all the farmers yeah. and, cause they're, and, and all these um, religious groups mm -hmm. because they're the ones that all vote. And um, exactly. that's why now for the young people, it's hard to get a good job. Mm -hmm. There's um, the, just the unstable employment, uh, just the contract work, uh, right? uh -huh. non-regular employment is at its highest rate ever for young people. When you interact with Australian in Australia, what kind of moment you feel, okay, I'm, maybe I'm a little bit different from them now because I've lived in Japan right now, and something like that, is there anything? <laughs> yeah, when I call a taxi and I'm waiting for the door to open, <laughs> it doesn't open. Oh, I got to open it's it Australia. myself. It's Australia. Yeah, yeah, or, or when I go home to customs and I give them my passport and they check it, they stamp it, they give it back. Oh. <laughs> you bow. Oh, did I just bow? <laughs> or when you're on the phone talking, you just, you just start going <laughs> like this. Um, you just see that, ah. And when you go into someone's house, you automatically take your shoes off. The one thing about living in Japan is you look back in your own country and you see what's really good about it and what's not. Right? They both come out very clearly. I can see, oh, the great things about Australia and I can see the bad things too. Just like in Japan, you can see Japan has some really good things and it has some really bad things too. Japan has given me the opportunities to do things that I never could have done back in Australia. Like what? Writing a book, publishing a book, oh, cool. becoming a university professor, getting a job on TV, radio. Yeah, you're a TV um, personality as well. Uh, many years ago. <laughs> But I don't want to talk about that because okay, okay. I was lucky it was before social media because I look at it now and I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I got to um, uh, interpreting. Yeah, I got to travel uh, all around Japan and around the world to a few countries as an interpreter. You've been to Korea 35 times. Yeah, I've been to Korea many times just because it's so close. <laughs> close, <laughs> close. Closer. It's just... It's just down there, yeah. you can almost... Closer yeah. than Tokyo, for yeah. sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I got to meet so many interesting people. All these opportunities that I probably would never have got to do in Australia. And I think maybe that's an attraction of Japan for, for many of us. What do you like and what you don't like about Japan? You mentioned, you, mentioned, you know, they have goods and bats, right? Well, yeah. What's goods and bats? Yeah, well, I, I mentioned the voter turnout. That's not so good. Mm. Boso Zuku, never, still don't like them. What's that? Uh, they're they're the, the bikers who just rev their, they cut off the mufflers and they ride down the street revving up their engine. I just can't stand them. Um, is, is, um, is it still out there? Uh, not as many as before, there. but there's still a few. <laughs> Actually, I live very close to the police academy, oh, <laughs> so yeah. they don't come around my house. <laughs> um, yeah, so good things. Uh, one thing, it's still bad, but not as bad as before, is the smoking rate. Everybody was smoking. When I first came, it was, it was like about 60% of men all smoked. And they used to sit down next to my pregnant wife and just light up. And I got really angry about that. But uh, that, that's dropped down a lot, but still... Compared uh, to Australia. Uh, well, Australia, you know, one packet of cigarettes is like $40, $40 or 4,000 yen. The other good thing about it is you can go out drinking in a pub and not worry about getting into a fight. You know, in Australia or in America, UK as well, you always got to watch out. You know, you don't want to bump into someone because they might start a fight. But um, you never see many fights in Japan. And um, if you do get into a fight, somebody else starts it and it's a Japanese person. They'll just say to the police, oh, he started it. And you get a, if you get arrested in Japan, you can be held for 21 days without being charged. <laughs> you know, it's really, it's really scary. That's the other thing. Doesn't matter what your personal stance is on any kind of drugs, even marijuana, anything, just leave it at home. Don't bring it to Japan because uh, if you get caught with it, it's going to be really, really bad. Really, really bad. That experience uh, translating for people who have been caught in the remand centre and uh, 
you don't want to go to a remand centre in Japan because uh, they can interrogate you every day for 21 days. So <clears throat> that's my advice. <laughs> if you come to Japan, leave it all at home. But <laughs> you can drink and drink as much alcohol as you want and they don't worry about that. On the street as well. Yeah, <laughs> everywhere, right. At, at the 7-Eleven, you know, grog's available 24 hours a day, everywhere. Yeah, you can do that instead. Well, Italy, don't do it too much, but at least that's not illegal. Oh, yeah. I guess you don't have Japanese citizenship, right? No. You have permanent visa. Permanent yeah. You never considered getting Japanese passport or stuff like that? No. Because to get a, a Japanese citizenship, I'd have to renounce my Australian citizenship. And um, the only detriment is I can't vote, uh, I can't stand for election, and I can't become a public servant with any uh, execution rights. So I can become a very junior public servant, but uh, I couldn't go up. So, you know, on balance, I think I'm better off with my... It doesn't make that much difference to me. So as long as you have permanent visa, then like I think you'll be fine for for your life. Yeah, at the moment. Yeah. Okay. About learning Japanese, obviously you you are translator, so you you speak perfect Japanese. But can you describe your process of learning Japanese, acquiring Japanese? Right. Okay. First, I wouldn't say I speak perfect Japanese. It's pretty good, but it's not perfect because I'm not a native speaker. But um, I was one of the minority who stayed, really studied Japanese for three years before I came here. So I'd had grammatical structures and you know the basic kanji and everything when I got here, so I had a platform to build on. And that makes a big difference. And um, it was my passion. So I spent all my time, every day when I learned a new word, I used to have a little uh, techo, the little uh, notebook in the, no smartphones in those days, and write down every new word that I heard. And I went to school. Never had any private lessons, right? right. I don't pro like private lessons because the teacher, it settles to the student's pace. The student has to keep up with the teacher's pace. And it's always good to have someone else in your class, like someone to compete with. You're competing against each other and you're going forward. And uh, I was very lucky that I had very good teachers. In Fukuoka, back in 1987, there was only one class for foreigners studying Japanese. That's apart from Kyushu University. There was only one class and there were only two students. And it was just in that building over there. Yeah, there was only two of us. And we had the teacher teaching the two of us. Uh, the other student's still a good friend of mine. After 10 years, 20 years, like, do you think your Japanese still got improved? Um, it's still improving. It's still improving. You never stop learning. You know, it's been uh, 39 years since I first studied, started studying Japanese. I'm still learning. I still pick up new phrases every day. Okay. There's idioms that new idioms I've got to learn. Onomatopoeia. I'm still learning. Any any new Japanese word that you learned recently? Ah, uh, maybe I don't know. But... Oh, well, here's one for you. Uh, fuaku. Huh? Fuaku. 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 Hi. I don't know. Oh. What's that? <laughs> fuaku. That means to be 40 years old. Uh, I think I have heard of it, but I never, I never recognize. <laughs> As an English Japanese translator, any advice to those who just started learning Japanese now, 2023? Right. This, uh, you might not want to hear this, but study kanji. Kanji is so important. But okay. for people like me from non-kanji countries, it's the hardest thing. But I really recommend kanji. The first 300 kanji are very difficult. But if you can get past the first 300, the next 1,700 take the same time as the first 300 to learn because they're just uh, combinations. And uh, when you do it with pen and paper, don't use it on internet or whatever, write it down, learn the kanji because 65% of the Japanese language is it's called jukugo. And the jukugo is this word made up of two kanji. If you understand kanji, when Japanese hear that word and they break down this word into the two kanji, and even if they've never heard it before, they can understand what it means. Right. But if you don't know kanji, you can't do that. And that's 60% of you know, the Japanese language. I guess many foreigners in Japan are mainly in Tokyo or Osaka big cities, but 
you lived in Fukuoka for your entire life in Japan. You never consider going to Tokyo or Osaka? Well, not really, especially when I see the morning trains. <laughs> uh, we don't have that here. Right? And, um, and anyway, Fukuoka, it's not as big as Tokyo or Osaka, but it's got just about everything they have. We're close to Korea. You know, Seoul's closer than Tokyo. It's only 90 minutes on the plane to Shanghai or, or Taiwan, you know, or very close to uh, yeah. Okinawa too. Um, you know, our airport's only 10 minutes from the centre of town. Yeah, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have a good trip back from Narita. Yeah, because yeah? Yeah, it takes an hour and a half from Narita airport to central Tokyo. So yeah. usually it's one more trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, so, you know, Fukuoka's a great place. And uh, we've got the beach, right? We've got the sea and it's not too far to the mountains and everything. And, you know, it's my community is here. Right. You know, my friends, my Japanese friends, foreign friends too. When I first worked at the pub, one of the blokes that uh, worked with me, he was a university student. Uh, he studied dentistry. Now he's my dentist. <laughs> and uh, sometimes okay. when, I, when I go get my, my teeth done, sometimes we go to the pub and talk about the old days, about Tencho, <laughs> about Tencho. our boss. So we've got those good old days to talk about as well. Your life in Fukuoka, Japan, is now longer than your life in Australia. Do you feel it's home here more than you feel in Australia? Yeah, well, I definitely feel more comfortable because uh, I've got my home now. I've got my house, and that feels comfortable. When I go back to Australia, I've got to stay with my brother or, or with, my, with my mother, and uh, I always feel like I'm imposing on somewhere. I don't have that place now where I have a community back in Australia. Of course, it's my home country. It's where I grew up. But um, I feel more comfortable in Japan at the moment. Anything you want to say to those who want to come to Japan? Ah, well, uh, Japan is a place that will give you opportunities to do things that you never could have done back at home. But when you come over here, there are some parts of Japanese culture that you have to adjust to. You'll just have to work it out when you come over. <laughs> like one thing, putting out the garbage. You know, if you don't separate your garbage, you're going to be a pariah. And it sounds like a joke, but it really is bad. You'll be outcast if you don't separate your rubbish. It's just one of those little things. There are things like that. But, um, you know, when you make true Japanese friends, uh, that's worth more than money. So I always say, right, the measure of your success in Japan is the number of people who come to the airport to see you off when you leave. And if you just come to Japan for years and then you're just going off by yourself, I don't think you've succeeded in Japan. But if you go to the airport and there's lots of people who have come to say goodbye and see you, I think you've had a success in Japan. So uh, my advice is try and become that person. When you leave Japan, you'll have lots of friends. They'll be sad to see you go. In the world in general, but Japan has changed compared to 40 years ago when you first got here. Uh, do you like more 1980s Japan or 2023 Japan? You know, they're good and bad, but like, which one do you like more? Not considering your life, just in general. I like the 80s because I was single. <laughs> that, was a, that was a great time. Yeah, but life was simple then. It was simpler, you know. You didn't have to answer 100 emails every day. You didn't have so much pressure back then. Um, the economy was a bit better too. You know, those times, but I think these days there's a, there's a bit more pressure. It's with social media, it's hard on kids. So those days bring back good memories, but... Would I like to go back to them? No. You just have to live in the present and do the best you can. So in the future, what kind of country do you think Japan is going to be like? You know, Japanese government mentioned they're going to welcome more foreigners every year, every year. You know, like in terms of that context, what do you think? What's, what's going to happen? I don't know. I don't know, but um, if they integrate and learn the language and make Japanese friends, it'll be better for Japan. But if 
you just treat them like migrant workers and don't accept them and, and don't give them the opportunities. You're just going to create a, like a second-class citizen and uh, that's not going to be good for Japan. So it's, it's really in the Japanese government and uh, the Japanese people's hands to realise that the population is decreasing. We need migration. Mm. Let's do it the right way because the alternative is, is not, not very nice for either side. Is there anything you want to say to the people who's watching this channel? Mainly people who want to come to Japan, who learn in Japanese, who are interested in Japanese culture. At the end, is there anything you want to say? Ah, uh, yeah, well, come on over. If, uh, if you want to uh, have an experience, have an adventure, Japan's a good place to come and do it. Learn a bit of politeness in the Japanese community. Learn the good things about Japan and teach the Japanese the good things about your own country. And that's going to be a win-win. So let's do that, eh? Thank you so much. Okay, at the end, let's speak, let's talk in Japanese a little bit. Can you introduce yourself again in Japanese? <laughs> Hi, uh, Chris Flynn to Moshimas. Tasho Nihongo Wakarimas. Koko ni yatte kite honto yokata. De, ano, oku no Nihonji ni o seo ni natte kita. Honto wa jibun de era so ni, jibun de benkyo ste era so nan dakido, ano, watashi no gakko, daigak no sensei. 友達、これ辺にある家族とね、いろんな人にめちゃくちゃお世話になってます。で、それをどう恩返しするか難しいですよ。例えばオーストラリアに留学にしたい人にいろいろ手伝ってあげるとかね。なるほど、ありがとうござい